Emergency Department at the Bank of Canada. It is my great pleasure to be the MC hosting this event today for Canada's first vertical $10 annual featuring an iconic Canadian woman, Viola Desmond. This beautiful venue, the Franklin Blue Forum at the Peter A. Allard School of Law at UBC is the ideal location for circulating this note. To tell you more, I'd like to introduce you to Regional Director Trevor Ferris of Bank Canada. Good afternoon. We are here today to celebrate the end of a long journey, a Canadian journey. Today we celebrate the public launch of this incredible new $10 banknote. Banknotes are not only a secure means of payment that Canadians can use with confidence, they also tell stories that shape our country. Now, each time this new vertical bill changes hands, it will remind us of our continued pursuit of human rights and social justice in Canada. Bringing a new banknote from concept to reality is a remarkably complex process. Few people realize just how long the process is and just how many people are involved. Some have an obvious role, the, the historians, researchers, and graphic designers, for example, who make this note beautiful and meaningful. Photographers and engravers also play an important part. Other folks aren't quite as obvious, like the chemists, physicists, and engineers who do the research on polymer and help develop the security features that make the notes so secure. And then there are all of our partner groups, many of which are represented here today. We truly appreciate the assistance of the financial institutions who help distribute the notes across the country. We expect these notes will be available at local branches throughout Canada over the next few weeks. We also appreciate the help of the retailers who handle the notes, as well as the law enforcement agencies and Crown prosecutors that help ensure these counterfeits remain very low. So yes, it's a long and involved process and a lot of hard work. But it's hard work that makes the process so worthwhile and the celebration so rewarding. Because after all the hard work, here's the end result. The Bank of Canada is proud to introduce its first vertical banknote. The bold security features are easy to check and hard to counterfeit. Feel the smooth, unique texture of the polymer and the raised ink on various design elements on the front of the banknote, namely the number 10 at the bottom, the portrait, and the word Canada. Look at the detailed metallic images and symbols in and around the large window. See sharp color changes when you tilt the note. Look at the large maple leaf. It appears to be three-dimensional, but feel it. It's actually flat. Look at the maple leaves above the portrait. The largest leaf is a clear window. And you can see the color of the eagle feather from the back of the note through the smallest leaf. Flip the note. See how the pattern in the eagle feather moves up and down and shifts from gold to green when you tilt the note. Notice how the metallic elements inside the large window are repeated in the same colors and detail on the other side. The Vertical $10 Banknote, a new direction for Canada's banknotes. I would like to highlight a couple of things that made the process of bringing this note to reality so special. The first is the public's involvement in designing the note. Very early in the process, the bank undertook a national public consultation that invited all Canadians to nominate an iconic Canadian woman they felt deserved the recognition of appearing on the bank note. The invitation unleashed a flood of over 25,000 nominations 
and an expert advice panel had to comb through all of them with us. This turned into a tremendous opportunity to learn about all these great Canadians and to give their stories some well-deserved and long overdue recognition. The second thing about this note was the ultimate choice of Viola Desmond, a successful businesswoman from Nova Scotia's black community who took a stand for human rights and against discrimination in the 1940s. Her story of dignity and courage has touched off conversations about human rights all across Canada. With this inspired and inspiring choice, the notes theme of human rights and social justice fell naturally into place. The back of the note features the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. This museum opened in Winnipeg in 2014 and is the first museum in the world solely dedicated to the evolution, celebration, and future of human rights. That is why the museum is an excellent choice to be featured with Viola Desmond on Canada's new vertical $10 paper. At this time, I would like to introduce Abby Iwaya and Mara Salanders, members of the Black Law Students Association. between worlds. Um, it's a reality that persists to this day, and I grew up in that as a child, and never really reflected on how little I got to see myself reflected in the world around me. And I attribute that to my perpetual need to go, to change, to explore. So after high school, I completed a degree in English literature and a minor in social justice, again, caught between worlds, and then went on to do my master's in journalism, and now I'm here. I've been in school a really long time, and it wasn't until the announcement of this $10 bill that I heard the name Viola Desmond. At first, I thought it was my own ignorance, so I shied away from admitting that. I was ashamed to not know such a vital piece of Canadian history, and not only that, but my own history as a woman of color. But the more conversations I had about doing this talk, I realized that I wasn't alone in my ignorance, and that that shame of admitting that ignorance may not only be personal, but emblematic of a larger and festering and systemic wound. Canada is not known for its humility in the face of admitting mistakes, or its ignorance, or any human rights violations. We may get there eventually as a nation, but it's going to take decades minimum. Viola's story is but one example of this, but it's an egregious one. It's also a reminder that as women, and as women of color, as Afro-Canadians, members of the various diasporas in this country, we have to fight to be visible. It wasn't an innocent oversight that Viola's story was not a part of my grade school curriculum. It was a deliberate choice to tell a story with a happier ending. It was, and still is, systemic erasure, and we have to resist that. No one else is going to do that for us. In the spirit of further imbuing this space with the wisdom of black women, I want to share a brief poem from Afro-Canadian dub poet Lillian Allen titled Feminism 101. Instead of being the doormat, get up and be the door. This poem is fundamentally about choice. It takes choice, an experience and a concept that has been kept out of reach of women of color in this country and all over the world, and returns it to them. Beyond that, it says our choices are not inconsequential. They are facilitating, they are transformative, and they allow our legacies and our generations to persist and exist, gaining power and getting louder. Lillian, like Viola before her, reminds us that we are not at anyone's mercy. Now I wanna invite Abby to Woo! share. Uh, 
Abigail and Abby. Um, I'm a second year law student, and I'm just going to start with a little about me. My family migrated to Canada when I was almost 11 years old from Kenya. And one of my biggest passions has been mentoring young women and girls, especially young girls of color, attempt to navigate their way through life. So, what does this personally mean to me? To follow along with Mary's remarks, this means visibility. Black communities have, have existed in Canada as early as the 1600s and continue to exist in communities throughout Canada. But often, black communities go unnoticed. To me personally, this represents the recognition that, that black women existed and continue to be a part of the fabric of Canadian civil society. It means that my children will be able to look at themselves and not simply see different, but see belonging. But more importantly, it means that stories of anti-black racism and resistance in Canada will no longer be silenced or confined to American examples and classrooms. It means that distinctly Canadian stories and experiences will allow those who face such racism today will have their voices heard. It means that this is Canada will no longer be an excuse. Overall, I am glad that we're making steps to highlight the existence and experiences of black women and black people. This is a first step, so long as it does not remain a pat on the back, but rather a pat forward for creating meaningful dialogue and change on the experiences of women and racialized individuals in Canada. So next up, we have Justice Nithya Iyer. Uh, Justice Nithya Iyer currently sits for the BC Supreme Court in Vancouver. She started her legal career as a law professor teaching constitutional law, administrative law, and family law at the University of Toronto, and then at the University of British Columbia. She left teaching to become a member of the British Columbia Human Rights Tribunal and went on to private practice, most recently with Lovett and West McCott. Her work on equality and human rights has influenced the interpretation of human rights codes and the equality provisions of the Charter. She has appeared before all levels of court in British Columbia and the Supreme Court of Canada. Justice Iyer was awarded the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal in recognition of her volunteer work in 2012 and became a Queen's Counsel in 2016. Following Justice Iyer, we will have Julianne Okot Bitek. Julianne is a distinguished author and poet. Her work has been published widely online, in print, and in literary magazines such as Event, Capilano Review, Room, Arc, Whetstone, Fugue, and recently anthologized in Love Me True. Writers reflect on the ups, downs, ins, and outs of marriage, transition, of marriage, transition, writing Black Canada's. Black North, Great Black North, Contemporary African Canadian Poetry, and Revolving City, 51 poems and the stories behind them. Julianne's 100 Days was shortlisted for several writing prizes, including the 2017 Pat Lothar Award, 2017 Dorothy Livesay Poetry Prize, 2017 Canadian Authors Award for Poetry, Alberta Book Awards, Robert Croach Award for Poetry, and 100 Days won the 2017 Indie Fab Book of the Year Award for Poetry and the 2017 Glenna Lucci Prize for African Poetry. That is an incredibly long list of credentials. <laughs> and we'll have Julianne following Justice Iyer. are important. They form part of the background norm 
that in sometimes subtle and not necessarily conscious ways, send powerful messages about the core values of a society. And when we're looking at Canadian currency, we're looking at Canadian society. And it's in that context that I think that a couple of messages about the new $10 bill are important. One is a message about equality, and the second message I'd like to uh, suggest is a message about who counts as a Canadian hero. Turning first to equality, um, as you may know, or may not know, Viola Desmond was convicted under a law that on its face had absolutely nothing to do with racial segregation. What happened was that she was sold a ticket to the balcony in the movie theater because she was visibly black. She couldn't ask for that kind of ticket. The clerk who sold her the ticket assumed, following the, the movie theater's practice, that um, you know, if you're black, you have to sit in the balcony, you can't sit on the main floor. And they sold her a slightly a less expensive ticket. She didn't know that the, the tickets to the whites only area were more expensive. And uh, she made what I think was a pretty obvious choice, particularly given that she was nearsighted, and I'm particularly fond of that part because I'm very <laughs> nearsighted. She sat close to the screen on, on the main floor. Um, as a result of that, she was forcibly removed, arrested, and jailed overnight. And she was charged with tax evasion. Now, you know, tax evasion is a crime, and it's a crime uh, regardless of the color of your skin, your gender, or any other uh, such characteristics. She was convicted of tax evasion, and she was pardoned posthumously, posthumously 64 years later. But the key point I want to take from this is that her tax evasion and her prosecution for tax evasion had everything to do with her race and perhaps her gender or perhaps other qualities about her. It was not evident on the face of the law. So the problem that we now recognize as racism in that instance wasn't, on the way, wasn't by anything that was written on the face of the law. It was all about the way that it was applied. And the tax evasion that she was found guilty of in that case was one cent. She had paid one cent less tax than uh, uh, was legally required. So what I want to take from that is to re remind us all that a great deal of the discrimination experienced by groups and individuals in Canada comes from the way that laws are applied not necessarily the way that they are written. And while it is relatively easy in this day and age, in this society, to point to facially discriminatory laws and say that's not okay, and uh, particularly cha uh, challenge them under the Constitution and have them bound by a court as not okay, it is a much more challenging problem to identify and remedy adverse effects of facially neutral laws. And that was the problem. That was the unfairness, the discrimination, the inequality that Viola Desmond uh, experienced. And I think it's very important that that is the image that we have on our $10 bill. Because her image, together with the text of Section 15 of the Charter, the Eagle Feather, and the Canadian Museum of Human Rights on this banknote, in my view, sends a message about the kind of quality that Canada aspires to. And that is very different from the kind of equality it has achieved. So, as I see it, um, it's a call to action. It's not self-congratulatory, it's saying, we need to do better. And so I think that's a very important message. The second point uh, is something about 
a society's heroes. And hero may be an overly inflated word, but by that I mean the people whose statues are in public places, whose images adorn our stamps, and who appear in our currency. Those people, those faces, those images, send messages, not necessarily intended, but messages nonetheless, about Canadianness. To the extent that those images are very unrepresentative of the diversity of Canadian society, I think they reinforce unconscious biases about who's an insider and who's an outsider, who doesn't get asked where they came from, and who's assumed to be here, even though that might be quite inaccurate. Before today, as I understand it, the only image of a woman on regular Canadian currency has been the queen. And her image is on the currency more because of her royalty than her gender. There's never been an image of a racialized person on Canadian currency. So if seeing Ms. Desmond's image is surprising, even for a fraction of a second, to Canadians, as they pull a $10 note out of their wallets or are handed one at a cash till, I think that's great. I think it serves as a tiny correction to the dominant cultural assumption that we have all absorbed, which is that Canadian heroes are white and male. And over time, as the Viola $10 bill becomes creased and stained, and actually, I don't know if it can be, <laughs> because it's polymer and you saw it was really, really you know, high tech, but the equivalent of creased and stained, I hope it becomes less and less surprising that when we think of the people that have shaped this country, the image of the Fathers of Confederation won't be the only one that comes to mind that Ms. Desmond's image will be there too, as will the images of other leaders of the diverse communities who have made extraordinary contributions to this society. So I'd like to leave you with this. Think for a minute about those heroes, the ones that aren't on the currency, and that should be perhaps. And if if you do think of those names, if they come to you, ask yourself, why aren't they there? And if they don't come to you, and that is also likely, why is that? We've heard about the public education system. We all have answers to those kinds of questions, and it might be helpful to reflect as you go out and get your new $10 bills, um, to reflect on should be on our currency. Thank you.
Also, Cecily Nicholson, who reminded me two days ago, I mean, next weekend, she's, um, the 28th, she's going to be receiving an award for, a, a Governor General's Award for Best Canadian Poetry. That's pretty awesome. Um, she reminded me that uh, the Viola Desmond 10 should make me, uh, should remind us all of other 10s in history, and that would be Pele, the greatest soccer player that ever lived, who won the 10, <laughs> and also Malcolm X, X for unknown, X for anybody, X for everybody. I want you to begin by reminding us that um, Viola Desmond, with all the icon, icon image that she carries, was also a woman, a black woman, with a body, in a body, who experienced these things that we, we recognize. And um, it's not enough to have an image of a $10 note. Um, it's, a, it's important to remember that there was a body there, the body that experienced the humiliation of being kicked out. And when she was kicked out, she was a body who suffered the humiliation after that and going to court and that whole business of the one cent. And the fact that so many bodies since, 72 years later, are still suffering because of the bodies that they, they are in. For me in particular, it's very, very strange to be here at UBC, having been terminated, not terminated, from my job a month ago from UBC. Nonetheless, here we are, black bodies. I wanted also to begin by talking about um, black and blue. And I love that Madame Justice wear kind of black and blue too. And I wear black and blue. And I want to think about black and blue in terms of those two colors. Um, black for power. Black also because its presence is undeniable. Blue for the bruised body, seen and unseen. And the black for Diane Desmond's courage. And the blue for the pain and humiliation she went through and the voices that we will never, ever, ever hear about, like by other Desmond's, and sometimes in the more egregious. Just last week, we had Desmond called in Vancouver, who was carded by the Vancouver police, who then denied that it was carded because they did not have a record of it, and whatever. But then there's all those bodies who are continuously carded by the Vancouver police, and we do not hear their voices, and those are blue. Black is for the night sky, when we see all the stars come out, every single star that can be seen is seen in the night sky. But in the daytime sky like this one, we only see one star. And we live in a country of only one star. And so on a day like this, that we reveal the Viola Days 10, the Georgia Strait reports that um, Johnny McDonald and Wilfred Laurier are going to be promoted up in Canadian currency. So he won't be on the 10, but maybe he'll be on the 100 or the 500 or whatever other currency people with money carry, right? So then we will still be having the woman, the black woman, and the $10 level, right? And the next level up will be the queen, and then we will have Johnny McDonald. And maybe when they design that note, they will also have on one side the residential schools and on the other side the statues that were taken down. Let me read you a poem. This is Gauntlet. Gauntlet is a poem I wrote in a moment of absolute anger. And so I call it Gauntlet because of the idea of throwing down a challenge. But Gauntlet also because there is a Scandinavian game that involves two lines of people and the, I don't know what kind of game this is, I'm not playing. Um, but it has two lines of people and the person who walks through has, is hit and, and punched and that's also gauntlet. So here's gauntlet. Oh, gauntlet was a long list for the CBC Poetry Prize. I think I shot you said, but I get to read it for you today. Yeah. Let's go write the poem. The poem that marks me, marks my body, marks up, inks down, marks terror, marks nightmare, marks discipline, marks carnal. This is where that how deepens because this is where if, how, when, and what we can write and now that I have become the script, listen. This is a poem for our own self. Let's go right where neither of us has gone before. Let's go see what's what. 
Let's go see the right, right. Let's go write the right stuff. The right, right. The right, wrong. The right lies in the archives and might have gotten determined by those of us you disappeared. But then determines who's who and who's what and who's when because you know that you know that you know. But that's my face your feet landed on last time, don't you? So then mark these words, mark me, mark this space, this page, mark this day, this time, the rest of your life, and like a curse, like the Hail Mary, like the petals of a daisy, you will always return to this moment. On this page, I got proof of life, I got full floated after in recent days, and I know where the red ribbons lay, I know the ones you call fallacy, the ones you call myth, the ones you say were of no consequence were lies, but after all, well, what Dion Bryan told us were signs of joy. As unsettled as we are, as uninvited, as perpetual guests holding to a story clad in dark blue, this is how, when, and how we got to this place, how we left, this is where we came from, this is why, house yes, and never home, and this is a Canadian passport, which is in my bag, but what been up with me. We left, didn't we? We left just to survive, so they could never claim that they got every last one of us. This is an actual name. One name, two words. This is my birthplace, Kisumu, Kenya. These are the demands of my face. Two words, a British queen's head on Canadian money. But you gotta wrap me up in Viola Desmond terms. Not anthems, not flags, not the brand blue of a Canadian passport. This is Canadian citizenship. This is me now. This is the point, and this is what I read. This is the rhythm of the page where my skull hardens and what keeps me awake in the archives, where the curses are spelled out, where we're marked up, and the symbol of your power is where we disappear. This is a Canadian passport. Where my savage meets for yours, where my savage is you, where my songs are the texts of this economy spelled out in music notes, where song and I stand to the woman a steam clock in gas town, prefaced and gagged by numbers like mine. The chorus of ancestors at the bottom of the oceans and the ones that go to above. This is a Vancouver lyric. Libelous like gas into gas town Jack, who often straightens out, threatens like Jack himself, not far from the angel who carries the body of the fallen soldier at the bottom of Granville Street. Watch the angel weep now. See how she carries on, how she drowns out the keening of around a steamed up Jack. We meet at the clock tower to ghost Jack out across time and space. Like petals, they are drawn to the center. I could be a single sheet of paper. Beneath your writing hand, mark me, write all over me. I have no black sheet. I am the song. Thank you so much. I would like to thank all speakers for their remarks, and a very special thank you to Dean Catherine DeVerne and Michelle Bertrand for helping organize this great event. Thank you. So this brings us to the conclusion of this ceremony. Thanks again to all our special guests for celebrating this new $10 vertical note with us, and for the Peter A. Allard School of Law for hosting such a wonderful event. At this time, we are inviting everyone to come to our expert kiosk, where we'd be happy to exchange an old note for a new vertical note, just outside the door. Any journalist in attendance can proceed to the expert kiosk where we'd be pleased to answer your questions about the new vertical $10 bank. Thank you very much for your presence here today and have a great day.
Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Hello. Hello. 